Good afternoon, boys and girls, and welcome to episode 27 of Love at First Scent with me, Persilaise, here on Facebook Live. And as usual, I think we should start by smelling a perfume. And I'm going to go straight for this one. I don't. I, I shall pick it up in a moment. I don't know if you can make out the name of it. Um, uh, I. I, I nearly sprayed this as soon as soon as it arrived the other day, and then it was um, somebody who may or may not have been Madame Persilace who said, "Hang on, I thought you were doing a video on Friday. You shouldn't really smell this until the video." So, so it is, it is all I've been able to do pretty much to stop myself from uh, spraying this because it is. Can you see that there? It looks like there's quite a bit of glare today. I'm not sure why. It is. A new jardin from Hermès, a new one for their garden collection. You can see some of the other ones here. And what makes it interesting is that it is, as many of you will be aware, the first one to be composed by Christine Nagel, which also means that it is the first one not to be made by um, Jean-Claude Elena. Um, in fact, the the, 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 the the previous jardin to this one, the previous garden, Le Jardin de Monsieur Lee, was one of the final fragrances that Jean-Claude Elena created for Hermès. So um, it's kind of a special moment for us enthusiasts, uh, geek geek perfumistas, whatever you want to call us. Um, and I know I know very little about this. That there is a press release that actually doesn't look terrifically bulky, um, which for once is a bit of a shame because Hermès press releases tend to be quite interesting. So. Um, I, I am genuinely nervous because I really, really want this to be good. I like what Najel, generally speaking, I like what she's done at Hermès. As many of you will be aware, um, I loved um, what she did with the Hermès uh last year. But I think we need to get straight into this. So please keep hellos and greetings, etc., coming and in the usual way, or rather fetching. What colour would you call that? Is that? Hmm? What would you say that is? Is that a kind of... I mean, I suppose basically it's brown, but is it terracotta? Maybe a kind of russet terracotta. Um, keep the... Please, please send questions and comments in and greetings and hellos, but I will formally greet you after we've smelt this first one, just to give people a chance to tune in. Peggy says ombre. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. And before I smell, I always forget to do this, I just need to go on the tablet to make sure that things are coming through. Yes, there's that dubious mug on the screen. Okay, so 27 episodes of Love It, 27 episodes like this. Right, let's have a look. Can't quite believe we're already up to 27. Well, I didn't even say what it's called, this is Un jardin sur la lagune, so a, a, a garden on the lagoon, and it's back to the un jardin rather than the definite article of le jardin that we had last time. So we're back to indefinite articles again. Um, enough stalling for time. Here we go. Now smell this actually announced this um, on their Twitter feed, the arrival of this scent just a few minutes ago. Where can I pop that? Can we put that in there? Okay, right. Oh. Mm. This is the difficulty of this doing doing this kind of thing live because there's a bit there's a part of my brain that immediately goes this is really Christine Nagel as opposed to being Jean-Claude Elena. And then I think okay but you can't just say that without explaining what you mean and of course that's when I would be able to go away and write hundreds of words and then try and reduce them into you know 150 or something but what do I mean I suppose I suppose what I mean is that it's not it's not quite as immediately translucent and open as some of the Jean-Claude Elena gardens were the, the kind of quintessential example of that I guess being uh, Jardin sur le Nil um, and Jean-Claude Elena himself said that for him one of the defining characteristics of Christine Nagel's style is a kind of sensuality, uh, a sort of Monica Bellucci sensuality, he said, as opposed to his colder, more Kim Novak style sensuality. And that's certainly an evidence here. This is, 
th th this is so far anyway much more cocooning and enveloping and warm really than than a lot of the other gardens but as to what's actually going on here i mean there's a sort of suggestion of watery um watery floral notes so n nothing obvious so you know nothing leaping out like the obvious incense from jardin sur le nil or the weird tomato ginger of the jardin près la mousson um the apples and pears of jardin sur le toit um and, and actually it, it's kind of making me think a little bit of twilly which was the 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 kind of main collection release um that christine nagel made for Hermès and 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 did it very well and that was a sort of tuberose ginger so maybe there's a kind of fizz here that's reminding me of twilly but but if it is a garden it's probably the most overtly floral one we've had i know that jardin uh, de monsieur lee was supposed to be a jasmine but it was quite an odd jasmine it was a sort of jasmine that didn't really make many people think of jasmine very much and the other ones haven't been overtly floral uh, the mediterranean one of course was a fig um so maybe christine nagel here thought you know um gardens flowers we haven't done an overtly floral one but it's very um it's very tender as well it 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 has got a kind of welcoming quality to it that maybe the other ones don't have um let's take a look at the press release because because i am intrigued i don't even know if it refers to a specific uh garden i don't know what this garden on the lagoon is fear not because even though it looks as though the press release is massive it's actually mostly a notebook with some rather fetching sketches inside it so you know thank you for the notebook but the press release is just this very slim leaflet in here so we've got un jardin sur la lagune I, I won't necessarily read all of it even though it isn't very long so let's see christine nagel's garden <coughs> had long been hidden behind overgrowth obstacle and denial one day she stumbled upon the tale of frederick eden's garden a story of enchantment of creation the pure evocations of a narrative that spoke of a world more inward looking um that first it seemed okay in dubious translation eh? of sumptuous secrets as intense and strong as the plants that grew there which had little soil to sink their roots into but so much sky to breathe okay during an excursion in a gondola the english lord tired of seeing nothing but water expressed his desire for a garden in the heart of venice okay an enclosed oasis of green under the sunlit blue fragrant and blooming with a thousand flowers his desire was so intense that the garden of eden its actual name no pun required came into being protected by ochre walls it offered happiness and a reverie among its cool shadows extending its generosity its all enveloping sweetness to its creator okay that 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 sense of being enclosed is definitely something that i got here and doubtless also to those taking a stroll nearby who are unaware of its existence but nevertheless enjoyed its delightful sense <coughs> uh, lives came and went their distinct imprint lingered on the old stones in the waters of the well and urns in the unique atmosphere between the walls nature please tell us something about the perfume nature which had withstood the test of time salt water and wind finally prevailed a century later this glorious mysterious past came to inspire the imagination of an Hermès perfumer the supreme harmony of a secret garden in the heart of the most transparent city in the world yeah i don't know if i call venice the most anyway never mind was too touching to ignore she dreamed of time suspended for the subtle grandeur of a simple garden unforgettable because nowhere forgotten unforgettable because okay, right. and so she imagined it through sense perceived without revealing themselves until at last she created it a palimpsest of sky flowers and sea Christine Nagel brings together the sweet and pregnant sense of nostalgia without sadness, of rebirth, a feeling of eternity, 
The woody, serene and tender breath of the garden is revealed on the shore of the lagoon where the dreamy salicornia bends towards the sea winds. I don't know what a salicornia is. The pitosporums, the madonna lilies, the magnolias. The murmur of their celestial fragrances caresses the silent dawn of Venice. A perfume is born which fills one with joy. It carries the secret sweetness of a dream garden. Un jardin sur la lagoon. Okay, so I think we got magnolia and lilies and pitosporums. Any horticulturalists out there, any keen gardeners who can tell me what that is? And the salicornia, I mean... Uh, what I'm getting as well is, is a marked citrus note. But I, I, do you know what? Even though this did turn into, you know, quite purpley prose, I am willing to go along with the fact that there is something marine-like about it and also something enclosed, something quite cocooning. Um, I should imagine this will probably be quite successful the brand, for the brand because I think it's going to be quite easy to wear. Maybe not... At, at, at this sniff, as, at least anyway, maybe not as interesting as some of the other ones. I mean, I still consider Jardin Après la Monson to be one of the most original scents out there. Not particularly easy to wear. I love smelling it. <coughs> I find it hard to wear. Jardin sur le Nil, I, I, I just adore anywhere. And I know it's a terrible cliche. I know I, I know it, it's a very, very successful Hermès scent, but I would say it's successful because it's really good. Sur le Toit, really great evocation of apples and pears, should you... You know, choose to smell like them, but it, but uh, Eleanor did it really well there. This is so far anyway maybe a bit less distinctive. Um, I, I'm not sure there is a very very concrete, clear identity coming through at this stage. Apart from this translucent, almost marine-like quality, but you know, I'm, I'm I'm not sort of for a second suggesting ghastly marine or anything like that. So, um, interesting. Right, let me see what we've got here, because I know I missed some comments. Right, so Peggy joined in. She was first off with the comments. Thank you very much. Fahmi says, hello from Indonesia, sir, and hello right back to Indonesia. Thank you very much for tuning in. Joe says, the new Jardin. Yes, I hope you realized that it was this one. Can I pick it up again so that people can see? Un Jardin sur la lagune. I do like the bottles, I have to say, and I like the fact that they've still gone for the sort of gradated colour scheme. Uh, Paul Keeler says, hey Persilase. Hello Paul. Um, Peggy says, of course there's less soil, it's a lagoon. <laughs> Very good. And uh, Anna Maria says, Jardin sur le Nil is really great and one of the perfumes I was wearing during my pregnancy. Ah, see, really interesting you say that because I also find it uh, to be a particularly meditative and soothing and calming scent. So interesting that you gravitated towards it. I cannot say that I have worn it during a pregnancy, but I think we'll just leave that one there. So, hello to everybody. Thank you very much for tuning into this 27th episode of Love at First Scent um, with me, Persilais. Joe says, what are those three Les Exclusives? They're, they're not new, but, but they're here. Can you not see which ones they are? I hope, I would have thought you could. I hope the camera has not like sort of cropped them. They are. Uh, Sycamore, Bel Respiro and number 22, but they are here because I think the very next one that I would like to do is a new exclusive, so they're just kind of here to, to keep the new exclusive company. But I was saying, thank you very much for tuning in to the 27th episode of Love at First Send with me, Persilaise, coming out on Facebook Live. If you are watching live, thank you very much for tuning in, and please, please give me lots of hearts and thumbs up and keep questions and comments coming. As you know, these episodes tend to be more fun if there's lots of interaction. Um, the more irreverent and the funnier the comments, the better. Anna says, the image is not so clear. Hmm, okay. Well, but perhaps it'll sharpen Sorry if it isn't too clear. It should be coming out to you in HD, but if it isn't, I, there's probably nothing that I can do about that at this stage. Sorry. Could be to do with my Facebook connection, your Facebook connection, not sure. Um, uh, please don't forget that what we've got here is initial impressions, and we mustn't entirely judge perfumes on initial impressions. That's one of the reasons why a few hours after the broadcast I like to do a blotter update, which I leave as a comment um, below the video to tell you how the blotters have developed. In the usual run of things as well, what I do is I up upload these videos to <coughs> I upload these videos to uh, what's the word I'm looking for to YouTube. Yeah, I upload the videos to YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to 
uh, leave a comment and give me a thumbs up and please 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 spread the word out because I am inching ever closer to that magical 1000 subscribers mark on YouTube I think last time I checked it was like maybe 948 or something like that so let's try and get to a thousand thank you very much to everybody who's subscribing and, and hello to all my new subscribers and 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 I'm sure there was something else I meant to say but I can't remember what it was today by the way I haven't got a cl I'm not doing a classic scent because there's quite a bit I want to cover but but I've got something rather special instead of the classic scent so please stay tuned for that um, a few more comments. Joe says, I saw you post on that Diptyque Valentine candle. It got me interested. Okay, well, perfectly good time to mention this then. This is the ridiculously limited edition. I don't know why it's limited edition. The new Centifolia candle from Diptyque, it is just beyond beautiful. Check out uh, one of my recent Instagram posts for a for a short review of it. They've also done a Damascena candle, which I'm going to buy for myself because if it's half as good as the Centifolia, it, it it will be breathtaking. Um, and they've also reissued their um, rose eau de toilette, their eau de rose, which which is just one of those beautiful, um, very very easy to smell, easy to wear, solid floors. But I wanted to put that here to keep pushing it out there. Although actually I shouldn't because it's limited edition. I don't want any of you buying it so that there's more left for me. So forget what I said, it's awful. It's probably the worst candle you could ever possibly try. Um, Paul says, sur la toit is 25% Magnolan. Um, I will take your word for it then, sir, sur la toit. The, 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 the apples and pears, yeah, I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure you must be right. Okay. I still haven't remembered what it was that I wanted to say to you, so never mind, we shall move on. And we will move on from one mega brand to another, um, because as I said a few moments ago, we have got a new Chanel exclusive, um, which which came to me a little while ago in, in a rather battered Chanel box, it, it, or at least battered on the inside. That did make me laugh, this sense of, I need to pick it up carefully, because, because it, it it all kind of fell apart. The inside the inside didn't survive um, the the journey, um, and 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 the sort of the, the base all came apart. So I, I just that, that just tickled me the fact that this Chanel box broke apart. This is 1957. Another one uh, in the exclusive collection that is named uh, after a specific date that has got a number. Chanel are good with numbered perfume names. This one is not one of the ones that I haven't smelt before because I couldn't resist spraying this one, but I wanted to share it with you because it got me thinking about the um, the exclusive. Um, let me just spray it and then I will read the uh, press release as well. It's not very, very long, mercifully. Um, now, I have to say from from the start because because I have a feeling that the tone of what I'm about to say about 1957 may sound a little bit negative and I don't mean to be negative about it. Um, how many of you out there have tried this by the way because I believe it's been out for a few weeks maybe and do let me know what your favourite exclusive is because I'm sure most of you out there will have a favourite exclusive. You are too committed um, a bunch of perfume heads to not have a favourite exclusive or even a, a favourite Hermes. Yeah, um, Yeah, I, I have to say from 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 the start that th uh, 1957, uh, composed by Olivier Polge, and probably Christopher Sheldrake, even though Chanel are very often cagey about Christopher Sheldrake's involvement, it, it is perfectly fine as a perfume. It is perfectly fine, and I would say it is far better than Gabrielle, probably even more interesting. Although I think it, it's that word interesting that. The, 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 that that is the issue around which that kind of stops me from raving about something like 1957 because the original batch of exclusive a lot of them really were interesting um sycamore was it was was uh, an interesting elegant um very powerful take on vetiver and sandalwood it still is i mean sycamore actually really kind of pushes things to the point where I, I can't always wear it because it's very there does start getting quite body odory at a certain point in its development 
But Bel Respiro, I really, really adore. Um, gorgeous green marine outdoorsy scent. Coromandel is 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 just a beautiful, beautiful gourmand patchouli. Number twenty two is probably one of my favourite aldehydic fragrances. If you've never tried number twenty two, but you like number five, you need to smell number twenty two. And that original run of some of those exclusive were um, some of the best uh, perfumes of their kind. Uh, they're, they're, even the eau de cologne, you know, fantastic eau de cologne. But something interesting. <laughs> so let's not keep using that word something noteworthy has been happening with the exclusive recently and that is that they have become less less exclusive and i mean that literally so to start with you could absolutely only get them at the chanel boutiques <clears throat> which i think in the case of london meant that uh you had to go to um the chanel boutique on on bond street then they started appearing in quite a few uh, airport duty-free shops. Then um, they started appearing, oh, I, I say then, I don't know exactly which way around it happened, but you get the idea. Then there were standalone Chanel exclusive boutiques at department stores. So for instance, in London, we had the exclusive stand at Selfridges. Uh, and I'm sure I saw a few at places like Gallery Lafayette in France and uh, maybe some, where would I have seen them? Certainly in department stores in, in the UAE. And most recently I've seen, uh, from my UK, British perspective, I've seen the exclusive at John Lewis. Um, and okay, John Lewis stores are perfectly good stores, you know, there's nothing wrong with them, but there, but, but there are a lot of them around the country, you know, John, John Lewis isn't exactly the, or a John Lewis shop isn't exactly what I think of when I think of the word exclusive. And I wonder if, because the distribution model or the distribution policy or strategy for the exclusives has clearly changed, the scents themselves have got to start becoming more mainstream. They've got to start becoming more accessible. And, and, and I would say that 1957 is a perfect, perfect example of that because it is essentially a very, very well done citrus floral with a huge base of synthetic musks, albeit very finely judged. Uh, this stuff is tenacious. I sprayed it on a jumper a while ago and, and, I, and, and, it, and it is still there, very, very strongly still there. They, they are very modern musks, by which I mean that they are pretty sweet and they're pretty syrupy. So we ha these are not musks that tend towards the animalic. Uh, they are very, very definite, you know, sort of fabric softener, laundry type musks with lots of sugary, vanillic overtones. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe a suggestion of the kind of, 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 of the sort of plush iris that we got from 1932, I want to say. Do I mean 1932? I think I do mean 1932. But if you also think of something like Jersey, one of the exclusive from years ago, which was basically lavender with a huge base of vanillic musks at the base, it, it's that kind of thing. And the exclusives have started to become more body conscious, I suppose. At the moment, actually, I'm getting an interesting little note of vetiver as well. So it, it's fine. It's fine, but it, it, it's not going to change the world. Uh, it, it, it isn't going to be something that I think, you know, people will be saving up tons of money for because they, 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 they cannot um, face the prospect of being without it. You know, it is not number 22. It is not Bell Respiro. Let's take a quick look at the press release. Uh, a couple of comments. Joe says, I tried 1952. It's quintessential Chanel, but also so unimpressive. Um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if I would change the word unimpressive for the word unmemorable, you know, because I suppose it is impressive in the sense that it, it, it's very well done and and I can imagine it performing fairly well. But an exclusive, I don't know. Um, I'd be very curious to know though what you mean by quintessential Chanel. Because of course, it, you know, how do we define a brand like that? Paloma says, we had the exclusives in House of Fraser in Belfast, but it's temporarily closed down currently. Do you mean the House of Fraser or, or just the exclusive side? I think, aren't the House of Fraser going though? I can't remember if they're one of the ones that are going. Uh, so, <clears throat> very, very brief press release. Rather charming graphic here with 
citrus fruit and florals and wood. Uh, this season, Chanel celebrates the year 1957 with a new eau de parfum in the less exclusive to Chanel collection of the same name. What? <laughs> this season, Chanel celebrates the year 1957 with a new eau de parfum in the less exclusive to Chanel collection of the same name. What's of the same? Never mind. 1957. The year of Gabrielle Chanel's consecration in America. Ooh, dubious choice of words. But also, 19, the day of her birth, and 57, to celebrate the reopening of the East 57th Street New York City boutique, the largest Chanel store in the United States. Okay, fine, we'll let them have that one, shall we? 1957 is a new fragrance that builds an olfactory bridge between France and America, joined by the iconic and timeless Chanel style. Okay, well, if it's meant to be American, you know, that sort of super clean safeness, then, yeah, with, 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 with a quite, with it, well, I have to give it, the, the, the sort of citrus vetti there note coming through is, is not devoid of interest. <clears throat> the third Les Exclusive uh, creation composed by perfumer creator Olivier Polge, 1957, illustrates Chanel's deceptively simple style. A balance of creamy softness and cocooning comfort that becomes unique on the skin of each wearer. Oh no, don't say becomes unique on the skin of each wearer, please. I'm... Sorry, Chanel, if the best you can do is becomes unique on the skin of each wearer, then you needed to get somebody else to write this for you. Uh, anyway, a quote from Olivier Polge. For each fragrance in the Les Exclusives collection, we explore a path we have never taken. This time I opted to work with musk more specifically white musks. Their whiteness hides a great complexity. Enveloping, they emit a more or less pronounced light and vary in their soft and sensual effects. I mean, white musk, okay, if you want to call synthetic musks white musks, that's fine, but I don't, I don't see the point of calling them white musks, really. 1957 is a skin scent that, no, it's, it's way, way too uh, diffusive and projecting to be called a skin scent, I think that, more than others, is revealed fully on the unique chemistry of each person's skin. Yeah, okay. 1957 is an assembly of eight white musks, delicately enhanced with floral notes of bergamot, iris and neroli, woody notes of cedar, powdery accents and a hint of honey to create luminous and powerful fragrance. Okay, the sweetness, I mean, I don't get... No, wrong one. Because honey to me, honey to me has always got a kind of animalic quality. So this this is this is more sugar than honey as far as I'm concerned. I mean you can you can think you can think kind of, you know, cheap supermarket runny honey if you like, maybe. Although maybe that's being a bit too cruel. But no, honey honey's got honey's got more intrigue to it, I think. This is this is honey stripped of its amber colour. Uh, comment come through, uh, Peggy says I would use the word pedestrian, yeah, I, I, I would agree. And Joe says, I meant by that powdery note that runs in most Chanel scents, well certainly recently, I, I, absolutely I would agree. Um, and you know what, I will, I will probably now give this bottle to Madame Perselaise and she will probably enjoy wearing it and I will probably sometimes say, oh is that that new Chanel, and we'll both just go, eh, yeah. Um, Although she was wearing cocoa today, and even though I'm not the world's biggest fan of cocoa, it made me think, gosh, that's a really, really good perfume. Whereas this is just a, a well done, fairly ordinary sort of perfume. So, mm, you know, just kind of shrug your shoulders. Maybe, maybe if they'd actually upped the citruses and the woods, it would have been interesting. Uh, David, hello, by the way, says Chanel needs to move forward. I was already so disappointed by Gabrielle. Yes, they, they do seem to be in a kind of holding pattern, but then so many of the big brands are in a holding pattern. They, they, they All of them seem to be worried about really going, pushing. Uh, Peggy says, please not dis Coco. No, 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 I am not dissing Coco. I'm not dissing Coco. I'm just not the world's biggest fan of Coco. But then that, that's because probably Madame Perselais and you, Peggy, are the world's biggest fans of Coco. <laughs> um, but what was I saying? Moving forward, yes. It, you know, when we're talking sort of large mainstream brands, it's probably MS that are doing more interesting things. You know, Tw Twilly was a wonderful piece of work. But if I think of people like Dior, Chanel, I mean, you know, um, 
I've even forgotten. Yeah, how could I forget? What was the last week? Joy. Dior's joy. <laughs> what? You know. Uh, and, and, and the musks here in, in 1957 could very easily make you think of Dior's joy. Sauvage, Gabrielle. Um, I can't even remember what the last thing that Lancome did was. They're probably, they're probably you know, still doing another variant of La Vie Belle and also lots of variants of Trésor, interestingly enough. Um, so, yeah, you know, what, what is there to say? Peggy says they're all trying to please the shareholders. Very likely, very likely. But, but you know, they might please them if they actually did something polarizing and interesting and different. So, um, oh dear, this is, I don't want to sound like, you know, we're going out on a downer here or something. But the, the, the two we've tried so far, the MS I want to return to because I'm hoping that Nagel will pull something interesting out of the bag and. Um, I don't want to smell it now. I'll smell it a little bit later. Okay, we're going to keep going with the big brands because I am also intrigued by this. Now, I'm very worried about this because, you know, Garlin is a brand that... Uh, hang on, why can't I learn to do this properly? Garlin is a brand that divides opinion, especially modern Garlin. You know, there are lots and lots of people who feel that they've lost their way. I really, really don't want to open that can of worms at the moment. I still have a lot of time for Garlin. I think they've got a very, very tough job. By the way, in case you didn't notice, this is another flanker of um, Mont Garlin. This is an eau toilette and it's called Bloom of Rose. <laughs> Peggy, Peggy's off, Peggy's off saying, oh no, Mont Garlin again. Yeah, but I'll tell you why I'm curious about this. The, the, we've already had one flanker, which was called what? Uh, Floral or Montgarlin Floral or some, something along those lines, something fairly predictable. I find some of the Garlin flankers interesting because <clears throat> I think they are an opportunity for Garlin to see what has or hasn't worked in the original release and then ma make it better. And Thierry Vassa himself said, for instance, that when he made Garlin on, which has been very, very sadly sidelined. I still think it's a very good perfume. Now, which way around would it have been? As it's a men's perfume, I, I, I think it was the Eau de Toilette that came out first. The Eau de Parfum was next, and it was definitely better. And, and uh, Thierry Vassa himself said that he was able to take more time over it. He was able to have some distance from the Eau de Toilette and think, okay, well, this is what I liked about it. Maybe this is what I didn't like about it. This is what I could emphasize. This is what I could tone down. And it's so often the way that the, the second or third editions of perfumes from Garlin are genuinely more interesting, genuinely better. I mean, that isn't always the case. The, the, the best of the La Petite Robe Noire's is probably still the original one, although some of the flankers have been pretty good. So I'm curious about this, but I'm curious also, not just because it's a flanker, but because I don't think that Mont Garlin is that terrible. You know, do not get me wrong or misunderstand me. Um, I do not consider Mont Garlin to be, uh, you know, après Londay or Vol de Nuit or L'Heure Bleu or anything like that, but I do consider it to be, without any question actually, one of the better of the sort of mainstream, main collection releases from the big perfume houses. So if you were, for example, to say to me, uh, Dior's Joy, Chanel's Gabrielle and Garlin's Mont Garlin. Sorry, not sorry, but Mont Garlin is the one I would go for. And the long suffering Madame Persolaise does wear it. This is actually her bottle that I've nicked, the, her bottle of the original one that I've nicked for the purposes of this broadcast. She wears it. And yes, I do think that in its dry down it is too sweet, but I do enjoy smelling it around the house when she's wearing it. So. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 think, I think I'm a bit more forgiving of Garlin than some of you guys are. Um, Peggy's written again, sorry, it's starting to feel like how many ways can you make a cup of instant coffee? <laughs> know what I mean? Yes, I do know what you mean. Oh, you're not being a bit too harsh? I don't know. But, but you know, maybe you're not a fan. Uh, well, clearly you're not a fan. Um, but they're, they're not quitting with this one, are they? They've, they've got the new Angelina Jolie images coming out. And... Mont Garlin with a stronger rose note. I'm a sucker for rose. I thought, oh, well, maybe this might not be so bad. Anyway, let's try. So this is the, this is the bloom of rose, eau de toilette, 
of Mongarla. Oh, okay. Okay, initial impression, a bit disappointed to be honest, but I'll tell you why, because it just, it just feels a bit thin to start with. And let me just remind myself of the, of the Eau de Parfum, because I, I quite enjoy the, um, the lavender feel of the Eau de Parfum. Peggy says, not true, big fan of the House of Gavilan. Yes, and actually, I guess it, it is because if, it is usually the biggest fans of Gavilan who are the people who are mo the most vocal about what they're doing at the moment because we want to love Gavilan, don't we? We want to be able to love Gavilan and we want, we still really, really do want it to have the best perfumes. So this is the original Eau de Parfum of, yeah, that's interesting. I think because it, because the original goes much faster into the lavender facet and into those herbs, it feels more substantial than this rose one does. I mean, the, the rose one, the rose one feels a bit wan, a bit pale. Um, hmm. Oh dear, what a depressing episode we're doing. Somebody say something to cheer us up. Right, but I, I've got something good coming up, though. I've got my substitute. I've got my substitute for the um, classic scent coming up. Yeah, I mean, already, already, maybe because of the kind of um, predominance of the vanillic sweetness of the original Lot de Parfum of Modigan, like it is. There's more to it. It's weightier. Whereas the new rose, I mean, the new rose isn't even overtly rosy it's 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 quite it's quite, well pe pale and insubstantial it's a, it's a rose that's been stripped of a lot of its color hmm well it it might develop i don't have a press release for it which maybe isn't such a bad thing so i can't i can't um regale you with descriptions of why they wanted to go for a rose for this particular flanker. And I do wonder how what, what the next one is going to be. Ah, I'm, I'm genuinely, genuinely disappointed. I wanted this to really wow me. It's almost got a hint of, it's making me think of, um, of aura, of Mugler's aura. David says, something good to cheer you up. My first fragrances are soon to be launched. That has cheered me up. When do we get to try them? Um, has anybody else out there tried them? Quickly, everybody, if you haven't made a note of his name, make a note of David's name now and pester him. Tell him to get a move on. He's, he's, been, he's been teasing us with making perfumes for ages. But congratulations to you. That's quite an achievement, David. If, you've, if you're at the point now of being able to release them, that is really, really something. Hats off to you. Um, hmm. It, it's, 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 it's like Mont Alain with a lot of the colour stripped out. And also, actually, a lot of the lavender, which was the bit, which was the bit that I really loved the most about um, the the original. Hmm, that's a shame. Okay, David says thanks a lot. No, thank you. You're welcome. Right. So, uh, quick recap, just to tell you all where we are. You are watching episode twenty-seven of Love at First Scent with me, Persilave at Persilays, at the moment coming out to you live on uh, Facebook, but the video will remain on Facebook. Uh, IT permitting, so you can still ask me questions and leave comments after the live broadcast. And also, what I always do is uh, upload the videos to YouTube, so you can leave comments on there. Please give me hearts and thumbs up and likes on YouTube and subscribe to my YouTube channel because I really, really would like to get past the 1,000 subscriber mark on YouTube. And this is the point in the broadcast when we usually do a classic scent, but today I would like to do something different. I didn't want to make the broadcast too long. I didn't want to include a classic scent and this next bit that I'm going to do because I would like to share with you this book that has been rather elegantly perched next to me. As you can see, it is called Perfume in Search of Your Signature Scent, and it is by a chap called Neil Chapman. And a lot of you may know Neil as the author of the Black Narcissus blog. You can see, can you see? 
that the, the, the pages are rather beautifully edged in gold and then there's and it's got a I think a really really stunning quite bling-tastic cover now I want to mention the book to you because uh, I'm sure you're the sorts of people who like perfume books and so you want to be aware of any books that are coming out in the UK at least it's being launched on the 21st of March but I'm pretty sure that it's not a UK exclusive release so wherever you are have a have a look at your version of Amazon or some online retailer to see when the books coming out but what I should say is, <clears throat> yeah, Peggy says very Art Deco, lovely, absolutely. And I'll show you some pages inside as well. Beautifully designed. I should say, I, I kind of feel a bit weird mentioning this book because uh, Neil is a very good friend. And as you know, I, I, I try to maintain as much objectivity as possible and certainly independence. You will know that, uh, you'll know if you read my blog that I never get paid for any uh, reviews that I do, I don't do sponsored contents, I don't um, uh, I don't shy away from doing negative reviews um, and and so I, 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 I need to be careful about how effusive I am about this book because as I say it is written by a good friend and I'm even mentioned in it you know I'm, I'm, I'm in the acknowledgements section uh, which is very kind of Neil. If, if you're watching this, Neil, thank you very much. I was very, very touched by that. I'm in the, you know, sources of information section at the back with the the, the Persilay's blog is listed. So, so uh, you know, I, I do need to say full disclosure. Neil is a friend, so you, you 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 need to be aware of that when I go raving about this book. But I do think it's wonderful. Um, when it came in the post, I. I was surprised by how fat it is. Now, basically, if if I flick through, because this is the best way to show you the book, you will, some of the design touches are really, really great. I hope the screen, the picture quality has improved. Um, all of the perfumes for which he's given longish reviews have got these really, really charming uh, line drawings of the bottles. Um, now, what's he done? Um, he's got... I, I even like, you know, even even a very, very simple Art Deco design touch there, I think, is really, really elegant. Shall I read you the blurb? Let's do the blurb. A beautifully made scent can encapsulate a particular feeling, transport you to a very specific time in life with clarity, or remind you of a special loved one or friend. And just like wearing your finest outfit or shoes, your signature perfume can make you feel invincible. The question is, how do you find such a creation? In Perfume, Neil Chapman guides readers through a world that can at times seem overwhelming. His informative and witty scent atlas features over 700 fragrances. From vintage perfumes through to department store classics, contemporary worldwide hits, conceptual anti-perfumes and novelties. Scents are categorised by the note that predominates in the blend, making the process of appreciating perfume more accessible and user-friendly. An invaluable tool for anyone planning to buy a new scent, perfume will steer you in the direction of a perfume you not only like, but a gem that you can prize as your own. And that's the main thing that I think you need to know about the structure of the book, the bit that I read, read out to you in the blurb. After the sort of usual introductions and a foreword by James Craven of Les Enter, um, the 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 write-ups the reviews are divided by main note so it starts with greens and within greens you've got grasses leaves and herbs and green florals and then it goes through citruses quite a lot of different florals uh, spices a section called eros which is interesting within that he's got powdery orientals ambers musks leathers then woody scents then meditative scents, and in that he's got a section on incense perfumes and Japanese incense perfumes, then oceanic, and then a section called anti-perfume and futuristic. And uh, I, have, I haven't read it cover to cover yet. It's not the kind of book that you need to read cover to cover. I've read the introductory chapters, and they are, as you would expect from Neil, really great to read. And so far, I've just dipped into bits looked at his reviews of some of my favorite perfumes and um, he does include a few creeds in there but you know nobody's perfect and uh, there is also one very very music amusing perfume that <laughs> mentions me and Madame Persilets but we'll kind of we, we won't mention that one at the moment um, and what, what what can I say about Neil's writing I, I would urge you to check out the Black Narcissus blog He's got a very, very, very particular way of approaching perfume, and I suppose the easiest way to describe it would be to say that it is extremely autobiographical. <clears throat> it's almost as though um, 
I, I, if there is a kind of typical black narcissus post, it it starts off with a with a reminiscence, you know, an anecdote. Oh, I remember when I was on holiday somewhere, and it goes on this long, very very evocative, always very well written description of the holiday, and then after several paragraphs, it will say something like, "And this makes me think of such and such a perfume," and then you get this extremely poetic personal, deeply felt, emotional, unashamedly emotional description of the perfume. And that voice comes through in the book. Maybe not in quite as a overt heart on its sleeve sort of way, but then that wouldn't have been appropriate for the book anyway. It's appropriate for the Black Narcissus blog. Um, and I think it's right that to some extent it's been toned down here. But you absolutely get Neil's voice and a very elegant and graceful voice it is, a very, very personal voice, very no-holds-barred voice in some ways. You don't get the negative reviews here either, which you do uh, on his blog, but I think to, 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 give you a, to give you a taste of what this sounds like, and I would really urge you to buy this when it comes out, I thought I might read two very, very short reviews. One is from the leather section, so this is his review of Cuir d'Ange from uh, Hermès. <coughs> And, you know, it gets straight into the first person, which actually tells you <coughs> a lot about his style. It says, I experienced a total flashback with this perfume, suddenly looking out from the window of my grandmother's bathroom into the garden while standing in the middle of Tokyo. He's based in Japan. It was her Kame soap, which this perfume instantly recalled, but more than that, her whole being, as though she were with me again in the flesh, superimposed onto the streets of Marinucci. Hermès has other leathers, Bel Ami, a spiced hirsute classic from 1986 that is still as hunky as ever, as well as its fresher modern leathers, Kelly Kalesh, based on the scent of the famously exclusive bag, and Gallo, a transparent rose suede leather. Cuir d'Ange is an outlier in this rarefied Parisian world of handmade leather products, an emotively musked and powdered floral perfume that smells both contemporary and nostalgic which I would agree with entirely. And so fans of Neil's writing will realise very quickly that the, the reviews here are a lot shorter than they are on his blog. And another one that I thought I might share with you as well, slightly longer but not much longer, is his review of Dior's Poison, because this one made me laugh at the end. A perfume that shrieked its way into the world in the mid-80s in a blaze of launch parties, magazine and TV advertising, Poison is one of the most controversial fragrances uh, sorry, fragrance releases of all time. Seared as it was onto collective perfumed conscious, onto the, uh, sorry, my mistake, onto the perfume, try again. Seared as it was onto the collective perfumed consciousness when released to the world at large in 1985, it was an unavoidable perfume that even the most committed perfume haters were unwillingly forced to inhale on a daily basis as varnished big haired beauties clammed up the airways with poison on the pavements of world cities, provocatively enveloped in mushroom clouds of venomous berries, plummy cinnamon, and purpled tuberosa musks. I myself love it, partly because it so beautifully captures my world of mid-80s teenage self-discovery. All the bangle-wearing Madonna wannabes and naughty girls at every party I went to smelled of it, as did their mothers, but mainly because I just enjoy its daring, delicious purple toxicity, the rich, sweet potion of pimento-spiced berries, coriander, honey, apopanax, and carnal tuberose that glows from the skin with such brilliant alacrity. Fruity, fun, and ludicrously seductive, Poison is also the signature perfume of my underground Tokyo cabaret-performing alter ego, Burning Bush. And, <laughs> and on that mention of Burning Bush, I think I will put the book away, but I will just say, do seek it out. Come, let, let's just just adjust it there so we're not getting so much glare. That's Perfume in Search of Your Signature Scent by Neil Chapman. Well worth your time. Al Mog says, hello sir, hello to you. Uh, as I say, um, uh, out in the UK at least on the 21st of March and I believe that the Perfume Society are doing a launch event of some sort with Neil towards the end of um, March, so if you are a member of the Perfume Society, keep checking this, their, their site for details because um, if you can make it to hear Neil speak, I, 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 think it would be, I think you'd enjoy it. Peggy says, he had me 
at Kame Soap. As for the bush, <laughs> you need to go on the Black Narcissus site and search for any references to burning bush. You will not regret that, I promise you. Okay, with just a few minutes ago, I think we have got time for one more perfume. I'll tell you which one I'm tempted to do. By the way, in case you're wondering what this is doing now, I don't even know if that's off shot, but this is what one of the 30 mils, the new 30, newish 30 mils uh, Frederick Mauls look like. This is the one for um, Betty Ver Extraordinaire. Rather smart, I thought. Pretty cool. Um, sort of, but, but these aren't refillable, right? So they're not magnetized cap, the obligatory magnetized cap. Um, they're not refillable like the travel ones. Uh, who's that? Almog says, I missed the whole video, we'll complete later. That's fine, better late than never, and hopefully, Gremlins permitting, it will all still be on there. I would like to try, I would like to try this. I'd like to try the new one from Juicebox. And I'll tell you why. I'd like to try it because um, it's inspired by Amy Winehouse. Those of you who, um, uh, hang on, let's hold it up. It's called Siren and Sailors. Did Amy Winehouse have a thing about sailors? I don't know if she did. Um, those of you who know about Juicebox will be aware that all of their scents, or at least so far, all of their scents have been inspired in some shape or form by music, uh, particularly by the idea of records. So, you know, there's 78 mils in, in each bottle and the, the packaging is, is pretty, where can I put this? The packaging is pretty lavish, usually. So you open it and then you've got something like, it is a little bit like maybe opening a record or a CD. And the bottles are always a different color, really, really chunky, substantial bottles. Now, I suppose that is a kind of Amy Winehouse color. The tops, the caps always look um, like, they, they look like, like old records, not old records, because they look like records. Okay, stop me. Never mind. Um, I'm, is there a write-up in here? Okay, there is something here. We won't look at it now, but a picture of Amy. Any Amy Winehouse fans out there, by the way? I, I do think she had the most extraordinary voice. I love her. Um, what's my favorite Amy Winehouse song? Probably um, Love is a Losing Game. So, you know, perfume inspired by Amy Winehouse. I'm thinking, okay, sounds good. Right, let's make some room here. If I pop that back on there. No, nope, I don't want that to be so far away. I'm going to keep that leaflet out so that I can read it right. I'm determined to finish before the one hour mark. Right, is that still going to stay, stay there? Uh, Almog says, nice bottle. Do, do you mean the Mal, the Frederick Mal? Yeah, that is very, very smart. So if I just label this blotter Amy, I'll know which one it is. Um, that's actually a really shocking pink, isn't it? <laughs> I've got a shirt that colour, I think. Okay, here we go. Siren and Sailors from Juicebox, inspired by Amy Winehouse, but that is all I know about it. Mm. Let's put that on there. Sorry, Neil. We'll just cover you with a bit of Amy. Um. Whoa! <laughs> Yeah, shocking pink is right. Talk about syrupy sweet but and rosy. Um, oh, like <laughs> okay. I want to. I, I will in a moment read how this was where they took the you know what they did with the Amy Winehouse inspiration because Amy Winehouse you know you're kind of thinking booze, cigarettes, leather edgy, dangerous, uncompromising, very, very, very assertive, very soulful. This is like sweet bubblegum so far. I mean, it, it, it's very good sweet bubblegum so far, but I'm, I, you, you kind of get the feeling it's going to change as it goes along. Let's see what the inside says. Um, Sailing and wandering through the colorful canals bewitched by the beauty of her voice. Camden Town, 2006. Uh, Peggy says, finally, a knock you sideways rose. Wah. Yeah, but I don't know if in a good way though, Peggy, to me. Oh, so you'd certainly notice it. Maybe that's the idea. Maybe that's the Amy Winehouse thing, you know, knocking you, knocking you sideways straight away. Camden Town is one of the most interesting and eclectic boroughs in London. 
and has become famous for its atmosphere, a place of individuality which issues judgment of others. Hmm. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, the opening of Regent's Canal and the construction of the railway gave way to emerging industries in the area – piano manufacturers, wine merchants, gin distillers and whisky warehouses, which transformed this previously suburban area into a place of bustling noise and steam. It became a part of London where locals would meet in pubs at the end of the day to share beers and local gins. Yes, all right. The 1960s marked one of the biggest shifts in Camden Town's history when it became a place of cultural and musical revolution. The Roundhouse, originally built as a locomotive shed and then transformed into a gin distillery, became a temple of rock and psychedelia and the venue in which to rebel against society. Camden Town is the environment in which a very talented young female artist lived and began her career. Amy Winehouse. Uh, who's that? Sally says, hooray, I made it. Yeah, you made it, Sally. Thank you very much for making it, tuning in. I've lost my place, though. Her brassy, sweet and sour voice, together with her eclectic mix of soul, rhythm and blues and jazz, enchanted everybody much in the same way a siren enchants sailors. Oh, OK. Uh, she brought soaring melodies, strident rhythms and lyrics soaked in passion back to popular music. You cannot think of Camden Town without thinking of Amy. Mm, I can. Uh, she embodied its energy, sound, colours and contradictions. Um, okay, it's calming down now. I mean, it, it is a, it is a, it is a powerful rose, a very very girly rose. I've got, I believe, I've got a little bit more in a press release, <clears throat> racing against the clock here. Where is the press release that I had for this? Because I think it had just a few notes. So what do we have? I've got, oh, okay, I've got that it's made by Julien Raquinet. Apparently starts off with, what is it? Uh, plays a mesmerizing song of warm, feminine, and sensual notes with Osmanthus. Okay, that's the, that's the gumminess. Rose Essential from LMR. Rum Absolute Whiskey Accord Patchouli Oil from LMR Vanilla and Musk. Well, let's see if the patchouli comes through. I mean, it's like a kind of, it's, it, it's almost like the teenage, br the brash teenage portrait of a lady before before she became more elegant and more refined. So, yeah, curious. Very strong, very, very strong. Okay, I think I should start saying my goodbyes. Don't forget that a few hours after the initial broadcast, <clears throat> after the end of this broadcast, I will be posting a blotter update as a comment uh, on the Facebook video, and hopefully all of the uploads will go fine, and I'll be able to upload this to YouTube as well. So if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to leave a comment, ask a question. Let's just very quickly go through them to see how the blotters are doing so far. Oh, this is the Chanel. Yeah. The, cit the citrus notes are, Claire says bye. Hello and goodbye, Claire. Um, the citrus notes are still strong. It's actually almost more a sort of citrus musk rather than a floral musk. This is the... Yeah, this is the Garlin, the Rose of Mont Garlin. Mm. No, I... Uh, not doing it for me, I'm afraid, so far. Maybe, maybe I need to try it on skin. Should always try it on skin. And... Oh, and the Hermès. The Hermès is... Kind of got a woody, ambery undertone, which is very, very different from the sort of floral thing that we had at the beginning. So probably need to give that one a try on skin as well. Uh, Peggy says, thank you, Mr. P. Have a good weekend. And you very as well. Thank you very much for tuning in. And Fahmi says, thank you, sir. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. I've got to put all this away now. I think I shall do it while burning the centifolia candle. Okay. Thanks very much. Look after yourselves and I shall see you again soon. Bye.